Stanley Kubrick's film version of The Shining, and David Lynch's Twin Peaks in all its different iterations, share a number of significant themes. Cycles of abuse hidden beneath the surface of the nuclear family, and the possibility of transcending trauma by way of esoteric knowledge and the paranormal. They also feature competing candidates for Worst Dad Ever, Jack Torrance, played by Jack Nicholson, and Leland Palmer, played by Ray Wise. If you're counting dead bodies and the sheer quantity of violence and depravity depicted on screen, Leland might be the winner of the Bad Dad sweepstakes. He's an attorney, a respected member of the community of Twin Peaks, and the head of the household to his wife and daughter. He's also been sexually abusing his daughter, Laura, since she was 12 years old, and he eventually murders her before she can graduate from high school. Jack Torrance is an aspiring writer, ex-school teacher, husband, and father. He's also struggling with alcoholism and has been physically and verbally abusive to his wife and son. After accepting a position as the winter caretaker of the Overlook Hotel, he is overwhelmed by a desire to murder his family. And although it's not stated explicitly in the film, there's a growing consensus that Jack has been abusing his son sexually. Something else that Jack and Leland share is the idea that their crimes are actually perpetrated by external evil entities. Jack and Leland are empty vessels ripe for possession by evil spirits. In Leland's case, the evil comes in the form of Bob, a manifestation of Leland's childhood trauma. I, I was just a boy. I saw him in my dream. He said the wolf wanted to play. He opened me and I invited him and he came inside me. Jack is being recruited by various representatives of the Overlook, a consolidated evil fueled by collective bad karma. As with Bob and Leland, the Overlook Hotel has invited itself into Jack, the empty vessel, and Jack lets them in. When he addresses Lloyd the bartender, it's very likely that he's also addressing himself in the mirror at the empty bar, much in the same way that Leland regards himself in the mirror and acknowledges Bob. It's interesting to note that when Leland and Jack look into their respective mirrors, they're actually making eye contact with the viewer, directly addressing the entities that may be possessing each of us, as well as bona fide abusers in the audience. All of which begs the question, are these evil spirits real? Or are they figments of the imagination, existing in the minds of some dangerously disturbed individuals? We're all familiar with the insanity plea and the claim made by many a violent criminal that something outside themselves compelled them to commit the crimes against their will. For many, this is considered a cop-out. When he was inside, I didn't know. And when he was gone, I couldn't remember. He made me do things. Terrible things. Bob can also be seen by Laura and her mother, Sarah. In The Shining, Danny also sees the Overlook's inhabitants, perhaps some of the same ones that Jack sees. Is the crazy old lady the embodiment of the cycle of abuse in the same way that Bob is? Eventually, Wendy can see the Overlook's residents as well. The Shining refers to the ability to see beyond physical reality. Not things that anyone can notice, but things that people who shine can see. This is his true face. But few can see it. The gifted. Does Cooper shine as well? Of course, these are works of fiction, so any discussion as to whether these spirits are real or not is already one level removed from our own waking reality. <laughs> Ultimately, does it matter whether they're real or not? Great party, isn't it? In Twin Peaks' key moment of uncharacteristic clarity and a bit of exposition that rivals the ending of Psycho in its literalness, Cooper and the other lawmen debate this very question of whether Bob is real or not. Maybe that's all Bob is. 
the evil that men do. I've seen some strange things, but this is way off the map. I'm having a hard time believing. Harry, is it easier to believe a man would rape and murder his own daughter? This argument underlies many different works. Life of Pi is one example. Some experiences are so traumatic that in order to cope, one may subconsciously construct alternative narratives. This doesn't make the particular details any less real. Leland has worn out his usefulness to Bob, who then escapes from Leland's dying body. But if he was real, if he was here, and we had him trapped, and he got away, where's Bob now? The idea that evil is an entity that can jump from one person to another is as old as dirt. In The Exorcist, Father Karras beats the devil out of the possessed Reagan, allowing the evil entity to jump from the young girl and into the priest, who soon takes care of that. In Stephen King's 1997 TV version of The Shining, which stuck closer to King's novel than Kubrick's adaptation, Jack is unquestionably under the control of the Overlook. But like Father Karras, he puts up a valiant fight against the evil entities and sacrifices his own life. I think the party's over. Thus absolving him of his sins and restoring his relationship with his son. There's no such reprieve for Jack in the Kubrick version. As for Danny, he escapes the clutches of his crazed father, possibly breaking the cycle of abuse. As to what will happen to him and his mother, the film is pretty open-ended. Kubrick's original ending for the film is much less optimistic. The scene presents Danny and Wendy recovering in the hospital. They're visited by Mr. Ullman, the Overlook manager who hired Jack in the first place. Ullman insists that Danny and Wendy stay at his place in L.A. once they're out of the hospital, and he gives Danny a tennis ball, an object that we've seen his father bouncing back and forth, an object that was rolled to him at the Overlook, inviting him to enter room 237. Does it suggest an unstoppable continuation of abuse? As Leland lays dying, Agent Cooper performs a funerary ritual straight out of the Bardo Thotal, the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Leland, the time has come for you to seek the path. Look to the light, Leland. Find the light. Cooper is trying to guide Leland back towards pure consciousness, an awareness of the non-dualistic reality from which the illusory phenomenal world springs from. The best case scenario is that the dying person recognizes this luminosity as the truth, thus avoiding the Bardo experience that leads to rebirth. This does not happen in Leland's case. The practice is Buddhist, but the idea of non-duality can be found in all esoteric teachings and mystic experiences. The ultimate unchanging reality, which has gone by many different names, the All, the One, the Tao, Brahman, Einsof, the objects experienced in the material world of time and space are just emanations, shadows, holograms, illusions. One possible way of looking at the owl symbol from Twin Peaks is as three mountain peaks, with one peak on the left and one on the right, representing the dualism of the physical universe. Mind, body, positive, negative, white lodge, black lodge, and in between the Twin Peaks, a portal to non-dualistic absolute reality, looking like a third peak reflected in water, which brings to mind Plato's theory of forms, the hermetic expression, as above, so below, and which also reminds me of the opening shot from The Shining. Laura Palmer seems to get a more overtly Christian absolution at the end of Fire Walk With Me. She sees an angel, a figure that's inhabited her psyche since early childhood, it's an image that offers her comfort in death, although she's not in heaven per se. The Red Room represents purgatory, 
or the Bardo State, where both Laura and Leland and other average souls await their next incarnation. In the film Dr. Sleep, we see Danny Torrance as an adult. He works at a hospice as a care provider, not a caretaker like his father. And he uses The Shining to help dying patients exit the physical plane in a service that feels a bit like Agent Cooper's recitation to Leland. Danny and the others who shine have a better understanding of death than most of us who insist on the phenomenal world as being the only reality. But do we need to die physically in order to recognize the true nature of reality and the illusory nature of pain and suffering? No, if you take the word of monks, mystics, Carl Jung, people who have had near-death experiences, or yourself if you look within. At the Greek Orthodox monastery at Mount Athos, an inscription on the wall sums up the idea nicely. If you die before you die, you won't die when you die. The Sufis say this, and it's central to Buddhism. Through the contemplation of death, you can truly understand that your identity, your beliefs, your memories, everything you possess, including pain and sorrow, will vanish when you die, because they were never real to begin with. Our entire lives are akin to something that Mr. Halloran once explained to Danny and Tony. Remember what Mr. Halloran said? It's just like pictures in a book, Danny. It isn't real. Just pictures in a book. And of course, just pictures on a screen. <laughs>